recording before I forget. So nice to see so many familiar faces here and some new ones, some great Zoom images. As always, we've got some really pretty artworks this time around, people's images. Um, so I'm Olivia, if you're right, I'm gonna jump right in, um, knowing that we'll have some more people join, but I love to reward the people who are here like me on time and get started, because I know we all have packed days, I'm sure. So welcome everyone to another Art at Noon. I'm so happy you could join us for our lecture today on Edna Cook Shoemaker. Those of you who don't know me, I'm Abby King, the Assistant Director of Adult Programs here at PAPA. And I wanna start by how we start all these programs, just by thanking all of our members on the call, all of our PAPA members. Thank you for helping keep us PAPA strong. Um, it's great to see you all each week. Um, these programs. If you haven't already considered joining, I'm going to drop a link to our membership in the chat in just a moment. But again, thank you to everyone for being here, but especially our members. Um, I know that many of us have, I feel like we've all been on many, many Zoom calls at this point, so you know what I'm going to say, but I'm going to quickly go ahead and just, I think everybody's muted already. I'm not, a, I don't even have to, um, but I am going to ask if you'll stay muted during the duration of this call. Um, we will have time at the end, about 15 minutes, 10, 15 at the end for questions. So we do want to hear from you, but just while um, our scholars presenting, if you don't mind staying on mute, just so our camera doesn't zoom over to you. Um, if you have questions, thoughts, feel free to put them in the chat. We are going to address questions at the end. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and start the chat in a second and drop that membership link as well as a link to our YouTube channel because we do record all of these events. So do note that we are recording. If you've missed any of our past Art at Noon programs or our other programs previously, feel free to check out. We have a wonderful library at this point of um, wonderful scholarship and conversations. So I'm gonna link to that at the end. And if you have anyone who wanted to make it today and couldn't for whatever reason, know that the talk will be online normally within two business days is when we, we share these again, depending, um, just because they have to be edited slightly. Um, so feel free to check those out as well. Other than that, um, muting cameras, what am I forgetting? I haven't had enough coffee today. Um, <laughs> I don't think so. So, but if you need anything, if you have any Zoom problems, feel free to drop them in the chat. Um, Olivia, I'm gonna ask before I introduce you to you, for you to unmute yourself and say hi. And if anybody, so everyone knows who our speaker is and you can pin her. So there's three dots at the top of her screen. If you wanna click on that, the drop down menu will appear. And if you pin the video, you'll be able to focus just on Olivia. Hi everyone, I'm Olivia and I'm really thrilled to be here. Thanks so much, wonderful. All right, and without further ado, it's now my pleasure to introduce our speaker today. So Olivia Armandroff is beginning her PhD in art history at the University of Southern California this fall. Previously, she earned her bachelor's degree from Yale University as a double major in art history and history. After spending a year as the John Wilder Wilmer Dean, excuse me, interned in American art at the National Gallery. She began a master's degree in the Winterthur program of the American material culture, which she has just completed. In the past, she has researched networks of artistic trade and collaboration, including on subjects related to early 20th, 20th century New York City salons, the art of the book plate, and the WPA artistic project, the Index of American Design. She is also interested in questions of self-fashioning, performativity, and intersections between theater and the visual arts. And today she'll be discussing research she did on the Edna Cook Shoemaker, on Edna Cook Shoemaker an early to mid 20th century marionette artist. Um, I'm so, so excited today to hand this now over to Olivia and thank you all for being here um, today with us. Without further ado. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Abby, so much for that and for this opportunity to speak. And I'm thrilled that we have this audience um, and that I'm able to share uh, some of my work on Edna Cook Shoemaker, who I believe should be better known. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Uh, and we can dive into the presentation. Um, all right. So I'd like to preface this by talking a little bit about how I discovered Edna Cook Shoemaker. As Abby mentioned, um, I just finished my master's degree at Winterthur. And while Winterthur just hasn't 
overwhelmingly enormous collection um, in the house. Less people are familiar with the collection that's kind of hidden away in the library archives. And so there's a lot of treasures there and I wanted to find out what was in special collections. And as I was doing my investigations, I came across Edna Cook Shoemaker and her archive. Um, if any of you are um, decide that you want to take a field trip, um, perhaps when this pandemic is through, um, and are in reaching distance of Winterthur, I would highly recommend a visit. Um, and the um, actually the um, link to the finding aid is in the event webpage. Um, but there's treasures in this archive. Um, and I was really thrilled to work with uh, Laura Parrish, who's um, in, um, archivist in the Downs collection and to create a really small library exhibition. So I do want to say that a lot of the photographs that we'll be seeing today um, are images that I took just kind of in preparation with for myself for creating this exhibition. Um, they're from an archive, so they're not images that are normally accessible online. They're images I took myself, but there's some wonky angles and there's the glare on the photographs. And I hope that everybody will bear with me with the images um, because know that I couldn't go back given the pandemic to take new, fresh, perfected images for this presentation. But I'm excited to get started. Um, and Edna Cook Shoemaker just seemed like the really, the ideal person to present um, at the this PAFA um, forum because she was a PAPA student herself. So Shoemaker was born in 1889 in Philadelphia and she would attend PAFA on a scholarship. And at this time, um, there were many women attending art schools, but PAFA was really a trailblazer in terms of offering um, opportunities for women. And many of you might be familiar with the other women that were Shoemaker's contemporaries who were attending PAFA and um, producing art um, on a national forum. So some of the best known female graduates um, were uh, Violet Oakley, which you may know, Elizabeth Shipping Green, Jessie Wilcox Smith. And here we have images, um, one painted by Violet Oakley um, and the other um, showing all three. Um, so we can see these women um, in their um, collaborative environment, um, but they were responsible for a wide range of um, artistry, but also illustrations, which is where Edna Cook Shoemaker got her start. So Edna Cook, um, when she first graduated, uh, got into the realm of illustrations through children's books. She illustrated some stories that we might know, um, Heidi, Hans Brinker, um, but also some kind of unfamiliar titles originally to me. The stories of Mrs. Mulworth, stories by Juliana Horatia Ewing, East of the Sun and West of the Moon. So here we have some of her illustrations. Um, some of them are kind of in an expected graphic style, but I absolutely love the image on the far right, which has kind of an art deco flavor, um, which is very telling for the time that she was creating this in, in the 1920s. Now, she illustrated children's books as her primary interest, and that's something that we'll speak more about further on, but her activities were very diverse. Um, she did covers for magazines, including the Ladies Home Journal, um, McCall's, for catalogs, for Baker and Taylor Company, um, for textbooks even by Scribner's. So she was really out there in the um, illustrational field until 1924 when, as these stories will go, uh, she married Orlando Shoemaker. She had met him working at the Philadelphia Settlement House, and he was a University of Pennsylvania grad working in mechanical engineering. So the two married, and they moved out to Media, Pennsylvania, which is about 30 minutes outside of Philadelphia. They had three children, Winslow, Abigail, and Oliver, and she began to have trouble fulfilling um, publisher's deadlines. So she gave up her illustrational work. And at this point, so often, the stories of women artists end in our narratives. And I love Edna Cook Shoemaker's collection because it provides a great counter narrative. These women did not stop being artists, even if they gave up their professional careers. They continued to have a creative instinct and Edna Cook Shoemaker's collection really emphasizes the fact that women's creative spirit could be expressed in so many different ways. So originally Shoemaker found ways for creative output like creating really incredible Christmas cards for her family. But not long 
it didn't take too long for her to discover um, what is going to be the subject of my talk today, which is marionettes. So with her husband, she formed the Rose Tree Marionettes. And um, this, for their children, they began to do performances. Um, she um, did not only the stage designs, so painting the backdrops. Um, here we see just a general sign for the performances, but she also did incredibly beautiful backdrops and she also created the marionettes. The marionettes, I do want to forecast, don't survive in the collection today, uh, but we do know that she made them out of play, um, that they had five strings attached and, um, and she, would, um, she would manipulate them herself, um, but maybe have a partner. They tried to have one person per um, marionette um, and so that they could give them really speaking roles. So I have some images of her backdrops, um, which are really wonderful. She did a huge range of performances. We have Peter Rabbit, Goldilocks and the Three Bears, here um, we have Sleeping Beauty, um, and so we can see kind of this mysterious forest scene and um, these beautifully dressed women. Now, these are the backdrops. Um, to give you a sense of scale, they're about three feet in height and five feet wide. Um, oh, I'm sorry, this is Sleeping Beauty. That was Cinderella before. Here we have Sleeping Beauty. Um, and so this very pastel in color, and we can really see um, the essence of her illustrational work being translated to this. And here we have Goldilocks and the three bears. So in the interior, we can see the three bears images hanging. So I think we can start to imagine through this um, the types of performances that she would give. Um, but we also have images in the archive that show the photographs of when they gave performances. Now you'll have to forgive me for the glare here because it kind of obscures the image, but if we look in this background, we can see the stage proscenium um, and the local neighbors that would attend their performances. They staged them in their backyard. And not long after um, she and her husband began work on this, her children wanted to join in. And that's really when they became the Rose Tree Marionette Troupe. They were a group of five and they all had different roles to play. So they would spend hours of practice before any performance. Um, Oliver, her son, was responsible for writing scripts and we have some of his scripts in the archive today. And it's really clear how much research he did and how many trials. Um, so here we have the script for George and the Dragon and he read um, George and the Dragon editions um, from through time uh, and really evaluated, you know, um, which decade or century had the most appealing story um, and tried them out um, for his own scripts and came up with the final script. So this is incredible work for a child. Um, then we have her daughter who was responsible um, primarily for the music. And um, Abigail would actually go on to a career in music. So it's clear that her experience with her parents in this troupe um, really set the stage for her future. Um, the music played a really important part in the performances. Um, and we can see here in the top left, we see the performance of Cinderella and um, a harp that's um, kind of positioned center stage. Well, originally, this was going to be an organ. And um, the, group, the family really tried hard to create a mini mechanical organ. They ultimately failed and they used a harp instead. Um, but it shows how um, ambitious they were um, with the music. Um, and then her husband was responsible for various administrational duties. He sold tickets, but he also managed the lights. He devised a system of floodlights for the performances and other special effects. So for George and the Dragon, when the steam blew out of the dragon's mouth, um, it was actually Orlando smoking in the background. <laughs> um, now, not only um, was the family really involved in this, but um, in 1940, they um, 
took it to another level when, I'm sorry, yes, 1940, when they temporarily moved to Rhode Island. Um, so Orlando was tasked with war engineering work at the start of World War I. And the family moved up there, and this was a great opportunity for Edna Cook Shoemaker because she was able to stage these performances not just for her kids and her community, but for an actual USO audience. She packed the materials in cars and went to different sites and, um, and gave these performances for troops. So um, this really set the stage for um, what was to come when she returned to media in 1943, uh, when she really jumped on it and started giving performances to large publics. Um, we see them advertised in newspapers, in the archive are tickets that she formulated and flyers for events. Um, she gave performances at a variety of venues, um, schools such as um, the Baldwin School, Media and Friends, uh, even the Bryn Mawr Art Center, and churches, women's clubs, teachers groups, even a 4th of July celebration. So um, at this point, her art was really reaching a public audience, and it's incredibly impressive um, how far this spread. Here we see um, a news story um, from 1950, and it talks about a puppet show that Edna staged. Um, uh, and we can see um, a tiny image here, um, a scene from the 16th century, serenade with strings. Um, so she was gaining attention for this. Um, we have other newspaper articles in the archives, such as one about her doing a staging in 1953 at Trinity Church in Swarthmore. And she expanded beyond this. So we know she did radio shows, um, and also she appeared on TV. This. Um, this letter from WCAU TV in August 10th, 1964, discusses her appearing on TV um, with these marionette performances on the T TV 10 Around Town show. Um, now, really key to um, this whole experience for Edna was that it was a teaching experience for her children. It wasn't only a fun activity or an artistic endeavor, but it was also an opportunity to um, learn culturally about the stories that she was producing. Um, when they did a Greek tragedy, they studied the legends, the art, and the literature of the period. When they did a French play, they even traveled to New York to see tapestries. So she really took it as an opportunity to teach her children a really diverse historical education. And it's this historical milieu that really set the stage for a proposal that she made um, to create a series of marionette plays that she would recall the great stories that have shaped destinies. And here we see a letter of her contacting the Ford Foundation, um, hoping to get a grant for $150,000 to do um, TV performances of this work. So she saw her work as a real teaching experience and what burgeoned out of just a performance for her three children grew into um, her really looking on a national stage to um, create marionette performances. She clearly saw this as art and sought to get it um, seen as, as far as possible. Now the Ford um, Foundation proposal also um, proposed creating a book. And here we can kind of think back to her early work with children's books. Um, she had an incredibly complex proposal that shows how learned she was. We have to think about the fact that this was in the context of the aftermath of World War II. Um, at a time when we saw the fracturing of um, international relations. And she really thought that by understanding the cultures through their national stories, um, we might be able to create a more worldly um, understanding. Uh, so it was incredibly utopic. Um, she cites Margaret Mead's thesis that people who have uh, similar social instincts when confronting danger um, or that that's a fact that uh, people have similar social instincts when confronting danger and these stories tell the tales of that. So she um, really wanted to emphasize a, um, a universal humanity. Um, she, um, so she started doing research on 
the national tales of many nations. Um, as I mentioned, um, they drew upon their classics. So St. George and the Dragon, they argued, represented England. Don Quixote's story, they wanted to represent Spain. They used Pinocchio for Italy um, and a story of Theseus for Greece, uh, three billy goats gruff for Sweden. Um, and they were reading voraciously, clearly. But she was looking to other nationalities as well. She really wanted this to be a worldly pursuit. So we see in her notes research on um, traditional folk tales um, and um, fairy tale stories um, that we would fami be familiar with as children's stories um, for many nations outside of the traditional West. Um, so she looked into Incan stories, Native American stories, Persian stories, Chinese, Japanese, and Egyptian. Um, and that's just what we have notes for. Um, and so it was actually these investigations um, for stories that related to Egypt that she landed upon research of the ancient Bible and um, depictions of the Bible. And um, this is the final project that I want to discuss is her work um, creating illustrations for the Bible. Um, so she drew upon early Egyptian art um, to think about this in the form of kind of like um, her early picture books with illustrations. And it, this was a um, project that consumed the rest of her life, but unfortunately um, never found a public audience or financial sponsorship. But I think the art is incredibly amazing and I um, wanted to spend some time going through it. So um, we have some of the covers uh, for um, picture book based on the art of Bible times. Um, so here's some of the covers she was thinking about. She started as she did going to New York and looking at tapestries for a French marionette performance, she started doing research on Egyptian art in her community. Um, so she landed on some images um, that we have in her collection today. Um, she went to the Penn Museums where there was a large collection of Ur seals. Um, and um, from there, she was referred to the British Museum, which had undergone a joint excavation. Um, and so we have photographs from the Penn collection and the British Museum's collection um, in her archive. And um, we can see, I think, this graphic tech or the inspiration from these images in her own illustrations. So very much this like registered format um, and the profile views and processional um, uh, scenes um, were mimicked in many of her mock-up illustrations. Um, we also have research beyond, so she um, acquired books on Ur um, and Babylonian artifacts as well. Um, so, and then here is another um, another image that we have of the seals, and I think that this is really interesting because. Um, it, it, um, let's see. So we have this kind of very similar professional format. She did this in black and white. Um, and we have a movement um, from uh, the war scene to a scene of kind of utopic happiness at the bottom. And there's this procession in it and we have so many different artistic styles that are, um, that are compiled in this image. But I also love, let me go on to the next one, this final image that I wanted to discuss. Um, and um, this is um, just such a modern image, um, but we can see the same um, historic inspiration with the procession and this um, kind of glowing linear um, lineup of figures. But it has just kind of a futuristic quality as well. And this is something I really appreciate about Edna Cook Shoemaker's work is that at the same time as she was incredibly diverse um, in her production, we see kind of a standard running through it um, of style of historic appreciation. Um, but she's able to be incredibly inventive and really imagine um, new artistic styles for different contexts. Now, I kind of want to bring it back to the beginning of this presentation when we talked about Violet Oakley. Um, and as I mentioned, I've kind of just taken a tangent from the marionettes 
um, to this ancient Bible project, um, but it was really her last project. And we see a very similar turn towards religious subjects with Violet Oakley. So here in the PAFA collection, um, we have some of the altar pieces that Violet Oakley did um, later in her career around 1942 to 1945 here. And she also um, did other work as well. She did stained glass and murals for biblical subjects. And I think it's really interesting to just think about this different context um, that women were working on children's books, but also on religious subjects. Um, and maybe these were the forums that women could um, find uh, for sponsorship for their arts. But in, um, in Edna Cook Shoemaker's case, this was not a source of sponsorship. Um, she never found sponsorship for her religious work. So it's clear that she actually had a passion uh, for the material that she was doing um, and, and studying and creating. And it was a really interesting lifelong project or end of life project. Um, and so I think that this fusion that we can see in the cross correlations between children's books, marionette performances, and this project to study the ancient Bible um, are some of the most intriguing things to me about Edna Cook Shoemaker's archive. Uh, for those of you, as I mentioned, who are in the area, I would really encourage you to um, go investigate her work at um, Winterthur. Um, but I'm just thrilled to be able to have studied it because I feel like it's a hidden treasure um, away in the archive in Delaware. So I wanna thank you all for um, coming to this presentation and I'd love to take any questions. Nice, thank you so much. Um, do you wanna keep the screen up for reference to go back or do you wanna end screen sharing? Um, and actually maybe before you do that, we had one question about Violet Oakley's religious pieces. Um, I don't know if it's, if it's these and Erin, feel free to unmute yourself and ask, but um, they, Aaron had a question if they're from the First Presbyterian Church in Germantown, one of the images you were showing. Let's see, um, this mural is for All Angels Church and um, the stained glass is for St. Peter's Episcopal. Um, now, I cannot promise you um, anything about these altar pieces and it's very possible um, that they were. I do know that Violet Oakley had a really interesting project um, in the 19, 40s to create um, portable altarpieces um, that could be displayed on ships um, for World War II soldiers. Um, so these to me look very much like portable altarpieces. Um, and that's just having read this article, what was in my mind when I saw them and saw the date of one of them. But it seems very possible that they could also have been in a church. And um, I, was it Aaron? Yeah. Um, Hi, um, if you have um, any information for me about where they are, I would absolutely be thrilled to know. There are murals at the First Presbyterian Church in Germantown. They need to be restored, they're kind of faded, mm -hmm. but they're very similar to her murals in the state capitol in Harrisburg. Interesting. And the lettering style is the same. Interesting. And I would encourage you to check out the um, PAFA collection because although I didn't um, picture it sounds like those here, there's, there were so many images for me to choose from. And it's very possible that studies for the um, Germantown church are in the PAFA collection if you're interested. Um, and I'm sure that if someday um, those murals are restored, her study drawings would be immensely helpful. Also, just to put in a plug next week, for those of you who are excited about more Violet Oakley, I can't promise that she'll talk about the, your specific question, Erin, in Germantown, but we do, next week's Art at Noon is looking at a lesser known Russian artist that was actually modeled for Violet Oakley and have this, has this really interesting intersection um, between these very different artists. So I'll drop a link to that in the chat in a second, but I was going to plug that anyway, but if you want more Violet Oakley next week, we'll definitely be talking about it. Um, so thank you for enough Violet Oakley. <laughs> Definitely. Um, so we have a lot of really wonderful questions in the chat. I wanted to start, um, George just had a kind of straightforward question about 
Um, if you could share her birth and death years, so the time frame. That's a great question. You know what? I am so sorry. I do not have her death year in my mind, but she was born in 1889, and she would have died 1960s or after. Um, I can look in the finding aid now or after this to answer that question. Um, well, it's been shared 1975. Um, oh, wonderful. Thank you so much. I know, coming in with the chat, we appreciate that. Um, <laughs> and so Eve has a question. Um, is there any sense from Edna's papers that she saw a connection between the marionette theater work and the sequence by sequence imagery in the biblical illustrations? That's a great question. She doesn't have a lot of writing on her art artistic practice. Um, so no, I did not run across anything specifically like that, but I can, that's a fabulous argument and I can definitely see it. And, and um, definitely, I mean, we see the stories playing out in these biblical images. Let's see, um, this one too. Um, and the fact that she was kind of gonna have it in a storybook format, um, uh, I can see the progression of imagery um, being really important. And I think we can also think about just the changing of backdrops in the marionette performances as kind of a progression of scenes as well. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Um, so Lee asks a, a little bit about those Rhode Island performances. Do you know if the audiences were for children and um, do we have scripts? So I remember one of your images is of a, at least one is of a script, okay. but. Um, Let me take us there. We have a lot of scripts, a lot of the ones that I read, um, and I can't remember any that I didn't read. Um, so basically, I think all of the scripts are for the St. George and the Dragon, and um, that was their kind of signature performance, I have the impression. Um, this is a script um, written by Oliver, uh, Edna's son, um, but there's many versions of this script. Um, we can see the mock-ups on them, um, him crossing it out, reworking it. Um, and then um, we have reference to the other scripts, um, some of which he wrote. Um, so um, I know that he was responsible for more scripts besides um, St. George and the Dragon. He did scripts for the biography of Robin Hood, um, which was not actually Robin Hood, it was a dog. Um, and um, also for Sleeping Beauty, I have records of. Um, something I really wanted to find is um, somehow recordings of the performances. I don't, I haven't had any success, but um, from that we could derive what was said, if we could ever find them. Yeah. yeah, so we don't have, you don't have an idea of if the audience was, like if her target audience was specifically children oh, or if it's... I missed that oh. part of the question. Um, so when she was performing in, um, in Rhode Island. Uh, it was um, USO performances and I have, I don't think it's just an impression. I believe it said that they were soldiers. Um, I think that prior to that, definitely her audience was primarily children and neighbors. Um, and after, I mean, I expected it to be primarily children, but I was struck really when I read the different venues that it seems like it was a multi-generational affair. Um, so although she was telling these children's stories, um, as I mentioned when I was discussing her Ford Foundation proposal, I think she really believed that anyone can learn from them. And I think she was really striving to get stories broken out of their niche. Thank you. Yeah, it's great to know. I feel like maybe you pick, I picture children, but it's, it's interesting to know this for a USO audience and, and the time, the timing with that. Yeah. Um, so we have a, a great question from Susan asking if you could speak about her materials. So you mentioned that the marionettes were clay, but do you know anything about the fibers or um, the watercolor paintings, really any of the materials she's using for these would be great Materially, they're very interesting. Um, yeah, I do have um, written down somewhere that the, uh, the uh, marionettes were made out of clay. Um, the backgrounds are kind of on a um, hard board, um, uh, which she seemed to have painted um, with kind of a watery paint, um, which you can kind of just get a sense of the brush strokes in them. But what I find most fascinating that definitely doesn't come out in these pictures is that they were rather multidimensional. So, in, for instance, in um, this case, the, um, 
the frames hanging on the walls are actually um, emerging from the walls. She pasted them on in kind of a pop outy way. And then in many, many of the backgrounds, she used um, fabric. Um, so this is kind of just like a rippling silky fabric in the window. Let me see if there's others that use it here. I didn't picture any others, but, um, and I really do think the paint varied because like the paint for here is much more of a um, opaque um, kind of shiny um, surface, um, seemingly acrylic. Um, and then here it's much more watercolory um, highlighted, it looks like with gouache. Um, so um, she was quite experimental in terms of her media, um, but the um, backgrounds are really in a, um, a standard um, shape and size probably to fit into her proscenium. Um, and once in a while she would do cutouts, I think, which is really interesting. Um, and then, as I mentioned, the fabric is a lot more intense even than just in the windows um, in the image I showed. Um, sometimes there's fabric just hanging on the surface. Um, and we can tell from the photographs here that um, sometimes she just kind of entirely composed pieces out of fabric. So we do have this background in the far right um, in the collection. And I chose not to show it because it's a real letdown of a background when you first see it, because we see the um, this kind of fabulous French um, style interior, but the center is entirely white. And I, kind, I mean, I figured something was in front of it, but it's kind of hard to imagine until I saw this photograph where she created this incredibly complex, you know, layered uh, fabric hanging in front. And then we have this glamorous bed. I would love to know more about the um, miniature furniture she used, whether she sourced that or made it herself, um, just this light fixture. Um, and then as I mentioned, her husband designed um, spotlighting uh, for the performances. So that was a mechanical invention as well. So we see a lot of different materials and these, a lot of creativity, I think. Thank you. Yeah, it's great to know. I mean, it's, unfortunately, I'm assuming with fibers and some of those materials, they're just not archival and don't last. And Right. And I know it was a specific decision just because it was being donated to a library, special collections, that that's one of the main reasons that the marionettes didn't come is that they really weren't perceived at the time as fitting into a library collection, which to me is an incredible tragedy. Um, but her descendant or her children um, actually are alive today. Um, so um, I, I think it, they, they have a stake in this and I would be really interested to know whether they have things in their own collection. So we have a few a um, few more questions. Thank you to everyone. Um, we have one that I wanted to make sure doesn't get too buried. So um, George had another question asking if Edna studied with Howard Pyle. And I wasn't sure if you knew that. That's a um, great question and something I'm very curious about because for those of you who don't know, um, Howard Pyle was the teacher for many, many artists um, that were illustrators um, and had his own illustration school. And it really seems like she could have been, but there's absolutely no reference to it. And given that um, she, uh, she, there's just such a short um, break between when she was at PAPA and when she stopped working and she was so productive in that interim, I'm guessing she wasn't in school during that time. She was really working and when she got out of PAPA. Yeah, I knew of I know of at least one artist that's in Papa's collection actually that I'm going to share. Um, Jesse Wilcox Smith, who is pretty her connection, um, but that artist is pretty well documented at least in our our collection here, and that's one of her pieces. But um, it's so I I would love to know more about some of these networks. It just sounds like we don't have a lot of the the data to collect it or to connect them. If that makes sense. Yeah. Um, and I think that even if she didn't attend Howard Pyle School, it was in the air in Philadelphia in a sense. Um, so she was certainly influenced probably by its presence. And we have one question of someone and thank you for answering it in the chat. But I, I think just for anyone who didn't wasn't here at the beginning, if you could give some context again to the show that you curated and because people are asking about winter tour and it is not thank you for confirming it's not opening and this is not something that's on view but you're sharing um, a bit of how 
it connects to Papa and your project would be lovely. Right. So this was an exhibition that I worked on about a year ago. It was very small in scale, um, but it was in the library where they have um, a space for special exhibitions. Um, and so winter tour, most people are familiar with the house tour, um, but fewer people, I feel like, venture into the library special collections and do um, explorations of the material there. And there's a lot of treasures. Um, so this is based upon Edna Cook Shoemaker's collection, which is held by the Winterthur Downs collection, um, which is the special collection space at Winterthur um, Library. And, uh, and so um, I began just as a, I was a fellow at Winterthur uh, for the past two years. Uh, so I began just to be very interested in what was in the library. And when I came across Edna Cook Shoemaker's collection, it seemed to have such a striking visual impact that it just seemed to be begging for exhibition. Um, and so I was really um, thrilled to work with uh, Laura Parrish in the library to kind of put this together. Uh, it's no longer on view. They rotate library collections relatively frequently just because of environmental conditions, we can't have paper exposed to the light for too long. Um, but you can certainly go to the Downs collection when it's open and um, see the materials for yourself. And that's a nice segue to one question we've already, it's already been answered a little bit in the chat, but just asking if there, because I know in this presentation, we don't have um, pictures of Edna Cook and her family, um, but if that's also a resource there as well. You know, I was going back through my pictures and I had felt like I had seen an image of her, but I could not find anything in my own documentation. So I can't answer that definitively. Um, my gut says yes and my facts say no. I'm so sorry. <laughs> yeah, and I think El um, Hari, I'm sorry if I don't know your first name, that's just your handle on here, said that there are some in the archive, but um, yeah, it's, there's definitely hard, it's hard to find things on, on this artist online so it's great to know that there's there's future for anyone who's interested that that's a resource they can use as well and I um, bet that was um, Laura Parrish who I was mentioning um, is at Winterthur and um, worked on this collection mm -hmm. cool. um, and so thank you for, for sharing things in the chat so we have another question from Eve who asked um, what other women artists slash illustrators did she write to and or socialize with um, are there other chunks of her paper trail out there? Oh, this is another great question, and I don't have any correspondence of her with other artists. Um, so that's a mystery to me. Um, a lot of her collection that's at Winterthur is really um, post her illustrational career um, when she was beginning these marionette performances, and I don't know whether the early material has been lost um, or whether it exists still with the family. Um, but I don't have any correspondence of her with any other artists um, that I'm aware of um, that I encountered. Um, I'd, I'd be so interested though. I mean, it seems like given that she was giving these public performances um, and given that she attended PAFA and clearly had a community there as any graduate would, um, that I would be really interested to see how those conversations carried through time. I also wonder if that contributes to how little known she is now. You know, I think a lot of the, especially women artists that we know about are ones who created networks like the Red Rose Girls or, are, are, you know, had these communities and we remember them almost as units, so. Um, right, and I mean, she definitely had a community, but the community was her family, which is just such a different um, story in terms of historical legacy. Um, and thank you for Roseanne for that lovely recommendation in the chat. I really appreciate it. And we have another question too about recordings. And I, I, I do want to mention, so feel free to drop some more questions in the chat. We have a few more minutes, but we'll wrap up in a second. So, or a few minutes, so drop things in. But in the meantime, um, this presentation is recorded and all of our previous lectures as well are on our YouTube channel. So I'm going to go ahead and drop a link to that again um, to so please feel free to check those out um, there. Also, if anyone has any questions or that they'd like to ask verbally, I, I forgot to mention that at the beginning, but you're welcome to unmute yourself and ask a question. We'd love to hear from you that way as well, too. Um, I don't think I've missed any, but let me know if I've missed your question, please. We've had such a, a lively chat today. Really appreciate it.
And I have one question while we wait and give everybody just another minute to do final thoughts, but I hope this isn't too patriarchal of a question for you, Olivia, but I'm curious if we have any documentation on, um, on her husband. So you, you've mentioned that he you know, did lighting and just, I'm struck sometimes by women's careers that are helped by a different sort of re relationship or marriage. And if we know anything about her husband and how he felt about these, her art and these projects. Um, at all. That's a great question. He's not represented in what I've seen in the archive um, beyond his his facilitation of her career. Um, as I mentioned, he um, went to Penn. Uh, he was worked as a mechanical engineer, so that would have definitely prepared him um, mm -hmm. for doing lighting, um, among other duties. Um, and I know he served in the military in World War I and was definitely doing mechanical engineering work. Um, in World War II, as I mentioned, when they were in Rhode Island. Um, but he was clearly um, a supporter of Edna doing these pursuits, which I just think is incredibly important. And the fact that he participated in them, um, you really need a, need a partner for a marionette performance if you're gonna do multiple voices and um, multiple puppets. And so he made that possible. Um, and definitely we can see, I mean, the transition from two-dimensional illustrations um, to a three-dimensional marionette performance, it almost makes sense that she married and took up as a artistic partner, a mechanical engineer, right? Um, that transition. Yeah, it's sort of a beautiful match to think of the way that and translating her two-dimensional work with this other, you know, with a person with a different set of skill sets to make that happen. Right. And I mean, I'm just thinking of that. I'm so intrigued by the mechanical organ that they tried to work out. And I'm sure, you know, he was pivotal for all of those little pet projects that, uh, that um, undoubtedly fascinated her children as well and taught them that skill set at the same time as treating, teaching them artistic pursuits. Nice. Well, thank you all for, for being here today. And thank you for more of the resources shared by our uh, a colleague on the chat from Winterthur about um, your, about the family papers and how those were, were um, brought together. So we really appreciate you adding that as well to this conversation. Um, so thank you all and thank you a huge thanks for uh, Olivia for being here and sharing this with us from Texas. We really appreciate, I, I personally, I'm, I own a PAFA alum as well and I never heard of the artist. So it's, it's great to, to hear her story today. Well, I so appreciate everybody attending and it's just, it's really thrilling to share this, especially in the pandemic where I feel like we um, feel a little bit of isolation and separation from the arts. It's, um, it's really exciting to be here. So thank you. Thanks everybody. And again, just a quick plug for our programs next week. We do have another Art at Noon before we have a just short break before we're back in full swing for the fall. But I'm gonna drop a link to that really quick in the chat. It does feature Violet Oakley. So if you'd like to learn more about this artist's interesting relationship with a Russian artist, um, please check that out as well. So thank you all. And we'll be on for just a, another minute. Feel free to unmute yourself and say goodbye on the way out. Great to see you Thank all. you very much. That was great. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. It was great.